to this week's episode of Build Your AutoCAD IQ. On today's session, the third dimension, we are going to be doing some 3D modeling in AutoCAD 2017. My name is Alex Bowler. I'm a technical support specialist based out of the Boston, Massachusetts office, and I am joined today by Victoria Studley. She's also a technical support specialist based out of the Manchester, New Hampshire, and I'm excited today, Victoria, because I drove up from Boston to be able to sit down right next to you in the Manchester office, and I kind of hope we'll have a little bit more of an organic experience for you guys. Yeah, thanks for coming up. Hi, welcome, everybody. It's nice to see you again this week. And last but not least, we got Nauman. He's our expert elite, and he's out of Westchester, Ohio. So he's going to be hanging out with you guys in the chat. And before we get started, uh, there's just some clerical stuff we want to go over. Um, you feel free to leave questions in the chat window. We do everything we can to answer as many of them as we can. Um, you know, the good thing to know is that the session will be recorded. So if you find yourself wanting to go back to something or you realize you forgot how to do something, you'll have that opportunity to, to go back and, and review this webcast uh, webinar. Links are also going to be available to you. Um, you can access them in the registration reminder email that was sent out to you guys. Uh, you also get a post webinar survey sent as well. And you can also uh, get this information from the chat window. Now, again, you're going to have access to all this stuff, so I'm not going to go through everything in detail here. But um, the things to point out in this slide are, are that you have access to the upcoming topics. You'll see uh, when the dates are and the subjects for each of those webinars. All of our webinars, past and this one as well, will be posted up onto our YouTube channel. Uh, we got a link for that there. And over on the right, a uh, huge amount of resources for you guys, access to the forums. And, and Victoria, when I talk to people on the phone, I, I'm always amazed at how few people still don't know that they can actually be a part of how AutoCAD is moving forward. They can actually participate and influence future releases. And guys, I, I really encourage you to do that. You can simply email autocad.beta at autodesk.com to join the AutoCAD Customer Council, or if you're interested in the LT, you can email autocad.lt.council at autodesk.com and, and let them know you're interested in becoming a part of the Customer Council. Another great resource for you guys is the Autodesk Knowledge Network. I think I mentioned this the last time we met. Is I, I like to think of this as the cerebral repository of all of us that work here at Autodesk. You know, a huge number of resources. Um, you know, troubleshooting, tips and tricks, uh, requirements. So definitely be aware that this is out there. And uh, yeah, great resource for you guys to have. I know we're constantly updating it with new articles. Oh, on like a daily basis. I'm always finding new things on there too. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you have been uh, asking about the Revit webinars, uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback from everybody um, with some interest in that. We are starting a Build Your BIM IQ webinar series. Uh, it'll start on July 27th. Uh, you guys might be familiar with Martin Stewart. He was previously helping me here on this um, Third Dimension series. Uh, he'll be kicking off the Revit IQ and um, as well as the uh, Build Your Advanced Steel IQ uh, webinars starting in July and then going through August. And you should see those uh, at least monthly, if not every other week to start. And um, hopefully you'll join us for that and learn a little bit about, uh, about Revit. I know I'm looking forward to seeing the transitioning from AutoCAD to Revit one. Hope to see you there. Oh, no one. Victoria, I'm partnering up with uh, um, Martin to present those uh, as well. So that's I'll be right. with you on the 27th. No one, that's great. I can't wait for you to uh, to join in on that. That'll be wonderful. All right. So today we're going to be presenting 3D modeling in AutoCAD 2017. Um, we've done this in the past. But um, we're going to bring, bring it uh, into a little bit of a different light, uh, take a different angle at it. Uh, we're planning to show you how to model a uh, chess set. So it goes from the, um, the board to all of the individual pieces. And hopefully we can do this in under an hour. Um, if there's anything that we don't have time for today, uh, we'll record some screencasts and get them out to you after the presentation. 
I know Alex, you had a couple things to to add to that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, you know one of my comments uh, from the past webinar series is that we kind of keep seeing a lot of the same things over and over again. And uh, you know, the one thing that we keep coming across is that table. And I thought, hey. You know, this would be a pretty good opportunity to supplement what we're seeing a lot of. And uh, so we uh, thought, let's put something on the table. And uh, I don't know, you want to go ahead and maybe do some polls? Yeah. Before we uh, get into the modeling portion, we'd like to know, is this your first Autodesk Help webinar? Okay, and we'll leave that poll open for... A few seconds here. So for those of you who have joined us before, welcome back. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. And we really hope that we'll, uh, we'll be able to teach you a little bit about 3D modeling in AutoCAD today. All right, leave it open just for a couple more seconds here. And we'll close it out. And let's share those results. Wow, good number uh, coming back. Well, welcome back. So we'll hide those, and the next thing we'd like to know is which AutoCAD-based application are you using? Are you using the full version of AutoCAD? Uh, you will need the full version of AutoCAD in order to follow along with the 3D today, but if you are using AutoCAD LT, feel free to stick around and learn a thing or two um, about 3D AutoCAD. Maybe it'll inspire you to check it out. Um, at the very least, you'll be able to open these models and move them around a little bit uh, if you do receive a 3D model in AutoCAD. Uh, LT. Uh, so if you're using one of our verticals, let us know. Let's uh, close it out and we'll take a look. What do we have? Well, a lot of you are uh, AutoCAD users. We got uh, a good amount of architecture or one of the verticals. Symbol 3D, we got some of you guys and a uh, good number of LT users. So yeah, again, all of you guys, welcome. Okay, I think that's it for our polls today. I didn't have one um, session specific, so let's just jump right into it. All right, so here is our agenda for the day. Uh, we're going to go through a whole bunch of different things, um, but you know what? Let's let's just get right into it. I think uh, the easiest thing is really just to start start making this stuff. I mean, it's all, it's what we're here for, right? So the, oh, Victoria, I'm sorry, I stepped on your toes. Go no, ahead, you no, start. That's fine, that's fine. Um, I think before Alex shows us how to model that board, I just want to make sure that everybody knows um, where we are in AutoCAD, so uh, nobody's left behind at the very beginning here. And to get acclimatized, it's a good yeah. idea. So here we are in AutoCAD. Um, you'll notice that if you're working out of the box, this looks a little bit different. Um, I am in the 3D modeling workspace. So down in the right hand corner, click on that workspace gear. And if you are in the default drafting and annotation workspace, go ahead and click on over to that uh, 3D modeling workspace that you see on our screen. Okay. So from here, uh, here are some of the pieces that we'll be modeling today for you. Uh, and let's get acclimated. So we'll be going over a couple, we'll be using a couple of the 3D primitives some of the, um, uh, well, all of these um, extrusion and lofting and um, these tools that are used to create 3D models out of 2D geometry. Um, in addition to press pull, uh, we'll talk a little bit about meshes if we have some time at the end. And we'll be using a couple of the Boolean operations, the uh, union and subtract. So in order to move around your model, you're going to want to use this uh, view cube up here in the right-hand corner. You can click on the home icon in order to um, get into a, uh, an isometric view. If you find that you click on that icon and it switches you into a weird uh, perspective view like this and the screen gets a little bit dim and um, it gets distorted when you zoom in and out, uh, you can switch the projection by um, clicking on that little arrow and switching back to parallel. Uh, this is really a, uh, a personal choice, uh, so however you like to work, go ahead and, and adjust it to suit your needs. Uh, we'll be flipping a little bit using the view cube, so using these arrows, 
um, using the ones here that uh, spin the model around. And the corners here. And let's see, what else? Um, oh, and then you'll want to know about 3D orbit. So in order to 3D orbit around your model, hold down shift and your middle mouse button and you can swivel the model around really quickly to see those strange angles if you need a view that isn't uh, labeled on the view cube here. And then uh, I think at this point I'm going to turn it over to Alex and let him get started on that chest. Board. Awesome. Thank you. And, and sorry for just kind of diving in right there. But actually just to, to, to kind of add something, you know, when you're using the shift and, and uh, center scroll button, you know, I like that the view cube kind of adjusts with it. So you kind of get a sense of, you know, where you are, you have a sense of consistency. And, and because, I mean, if you're like spinning around all over, you, know, you can get yourself really disoriented. And it's nice that the view cube kind of keeps track of where you are. But, all right, let's get started with the chessboard. Got our template file here. Guys, if um, you have access to the, um, the data, you can go ahead and open it up because we have all of our layers predefined for us here. And, you know, we want to have these just, you know, for, for being um, organized. Now, let me, let me start by creating the top black and white matrix of the chessboard that we're, we're very familiar with. I'm going to start by making a box primitive. I'm going to go up here, select box. And just for this example, I'm going to start, you know, at zero, zero. And kind of like being at a little bit of an angle. And if you look at the bottom, you can, you'll notice that we have two options. You can either make a cube um, or you can identify things in terms of length. And the difference is if I select cube and assign two inches, it'll assign equal two inches to the X, Y, Z faces of that cube. Or if I do length, then I can specify each one of them individually. So for the white cell, I'm just going to show you guys the cube. Another handy thing is to make sure that you have your polar tracking on because we want to keep ourselves in a nice organized, uh, you know, in line with the X axis for this. So I type in C and, oh, you know what? I think I, I missed something. If you guys are following along, one thing that we do want to make sure is that we are in the right units. And yes, we are. If you guys aren't, uh, we're going to be working in this architectural. So again, if you guys typed in units, it might default to something else, but we want architectural because we're going to be working in terms of inches and we want to be able to put that information in, in terms of inches. So just thought I'd mention that. So now we are with our two inch by two inch by two inch cube. But you know what, for a chessboard, white cell kind of looks a little goofy. So what we can do is we can right click and go to properties and you'll see here, these are all the different parts of this cube that we can modify. We can change its position and from within here we could change um, the length, the width and the height. And so for this, let's do something like half an inch. All right, that looks a little bit more reasonable. And another catch is I realize I still did this on our zero layer. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, I know. Victoria's slapping my hand. No. But I'm going <laughs> to make sure. You layer set up in the drawing. So. <laughs> and I didn't use it. <laughs> so here we go. I'm going to make sure that's on the white layer. And there we go. Now, I'm going to make my black layer. And Victoria, I'm going to make sure I'm on the black Excellent. layer. Okay. Now, I'm going to close this up. And I want to show you guys just how the other cube primitive works quickly. So, uh, our box primitive, rather. Instead of using the cube, I'm going to, whoops, Let's see what's going on here. Box. Grab that. I'm going to type in L for length. And you'll see I'll be able to individually assign distances to the X, Y, Z size of our cube. And I'm going to bring this up half an inch. 
That makes it a little quicker than um, having that two by two by two cube and then having to adjust it afterwards, right? Exactly, exactly. But it's good to know that if you do inadvertently do that, you can still go into the properties and change all the different parameters if you wanted to. But yeah, definitely good. All right. So well, we got two cells down, but we got a long way to go. I mean, if you look at a chessboard, we got a lot of different cells as part of the matrix of the the board itself. Now, if you really wanted to, you could just kind of keep reproducing these over and over and over again. Um, you could copy and paste them, but I want to show you guys a couple of really cool tricks to kind of help us out with this. And actually, to help visualize what's going on, I'm going to make that a little darker. I'm going to select my two cells here. And I'm actually going to use the array command. Now this is pretty cool. Let me show you what's going to go on. We have our options of different types of array, but for this demonstration, we're just going to be using the rectangular array. And you see if I click it, it's automatically replicated my black and white cells over and over again. But that's not quite right. If I tag the array, I can go up here and I can modify the number of columns, the rows, the space in between. And luckily, I figured this out before, but we want four rows and four columns. And I want four inches between, because remember, my cells are two inches each. So four inch separation in this orientation will stack them up. But I want to actually leave a little bit of space in between. I'm going to set my between in this orientation to four inches as well, because as I'm sure we're all aware, we still need to have the alternating pattern in the other direction as well. So again, just like many things in CAD, there's like always many, many different ways to do the same thing to achieve the same objective. But Victoria was actually the one that showed me this other cool trick. I'm going to select my array. And I'm going to type in mirror 3D. Now I'm going to select bottom or upper left corner there and upper right corner there. And I want to go down to this lower right corner. And essentially what this should do is flip it around itself. Now, trick question, delete the source object? No. I want to keep it. And then there you go. So if you can kind of figure it out, it kind of just flipped on top of that plane that I had defined selecting that upper left and upper right and then kind of pointing downwards. So now it's just a simple matter of typing in M to move. I'm going to grab that corner, bring it into here, and then look at that. I mean, in a matter of like that beats creating a second array. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, no, it, it was super fast. I actually didn't really know about that until you showed me the yep. other day. So, Mirror 3D. Mirror 3D. Uh, it's a pretty handy one to know. So we've gone and we created the top matrix of black and white cells, but I don't know. I, I wouldn't really spend a whole lot of money on something that just looked it's like that. pretty basic. Yeah. Don't they make those, um, what they have... Uh, really cool looking perimeters and sometimes they have some curves to them. Right. Yeah, let's go ahead and do something like that. I mean, that, right. that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. So let's see if we have a layer for, let's use this border edge layer. Let's make sure we got that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a rectangle from that end over to this end. Now there is a rectangle in there. It's really hard to figure out that there is anything there. So you know what? I'm actually going to go ahead and I'm going to freeze my upper matrix just because I want to see what's going on here. I'm going to use the offset. Essentially I'm going to be building outward from my matrix and I want, at first I'm going to do a nice clean, you know, edge to it. I can apply material to it later, kind of give it some nice effects. But, you know, I kind of want my original or my first edge to be just kind of rectangular before maybe I get to some more artistic kind of stuff. To hold them all exactly, exactly. So I'm going to use this offset command right there. I'm going to click on, whoops, I 
going to specify the distance. It always helps to read the command line. So why don't we create, uh, you know, an edge that's a quarter of an inch thick. I'm going to select my rectangle, and you'll see, depending on which side of my original rectangle I go, my second offset rectangle is going to appear on, on one or the other side. So I want to work outward. So there you go. Using the offset command, I replicated that rectangle, and now it's on the outside. Now, if I bring my matrix back on, you'll see I'm kind of along the edge here. Now, I can do this one of two ways. I can either use the extrude command to select the rectangle and move everything up and down, but let me show you what's going to happen. If I did that, we're actually going to be extruding the whole interior of our chessboard. And I really don't want to do that because, you know, maybe I'm thinking ahead, I'm planning ahead, and I'm going to be 3D printing maybe these individual components. You know, if I just wanted to have, like, that edge without a volume in the middle of it, I'd have to use the subtract to do that. And I think you're going to be it touching... Like, yeah, but it sounds like an extra step. Yeah, you know what? There's... there's a tool that exactly. Just, and just get that, that edge. Absolutely. And there is. I'm going to turn my... Actually, leave that off for a second. I'm going to use this other thing called press pull. And the great thing about this is that I'm not actually selecting the, the rectangles themselves. I can select the space in between and just have my edge volume represented by the two, the in-between space of those two rectangles. And I'm going to just, I'm going to eyeball this. I'm going to turn my matrix back on. I'm going to go to press pull. Grab that space in between, and I don't know, Victoria, what do you think? Something like that. I bet, good? I bet if you click on that corner, it'll make it flush with those. Yeah, uh, there you go. Good call. Right? So there you go. So we have our like a, a start to our edge, but you know what? I'm not a big fan of this. Let's uh, let's start getting into some more artistic stuff. It's a little boring, yeah. It is. Okay. It is. Well, I'm going to create a second rectangle. I'm going to grab the upper left corner there and the upper, you know what, actually, Victoria, I'm going to make a new layer. Oh, another edge layer. Yeah, because I'm, I'm probably going to want to see this. I'm going to type in layer. This is just the way I like doing it. Um, typing in the layer command will open up our layer properties manager. And let me just kind of expand this. All right. I'm going to hit this little icon up here, new layer. Let's call it Board Edge 2. There we go. And if I double click it, little green arrow is going to show that that layer is active, and I'll see it up here as well. So I'm going to do that over again. I'm going to create a rectangle, upper left and upper right. And the reason why I'm, I wanted to do that is I'm actually going to freeze this stuff so I only see, oops, I only see that edge that I created. Now, I don't know if you guys have seen a lot of chess boards, but, you know, I like the ones that have, like, that nice rounded edge to them. So I want to try to create that rounded edge. And the best way to do that is actually to create the edge in profile. So I'm going to go, you see my view cube here, I'm going to select on front. But you see this little XYZ widget? And yes, I said Z. It's a very Canadian thing. It is a very Canadian say. thing to say. <laughs> and again, if you're outside the States and we're working in inches, I apologize. But for this example, we'll just go ahead with it. Now, you'll see I have my XYZ plane here. This is the Cartesian plane that just comes whenever you load in or open up AutoCAD. It's the default uh, Cartesian system. It's also known as the World Coordinate System, or WCS. But I want to actually be working in that profile, like I said before, but I, I still want to be in that XY plane. So what I can do is I can create a, a user coordinate system, or UCS, and I could just type in UCS. And you'll see at the bottom I have a whole lot of options. 
And I know just from orienting myself looking at the front, I need to rotate about the X axis. So I'm going to just type in X and I'm going to type in 90, which was the default. So you'll see my XYZ widget has now switched to a new orientation. If you're having trouble... Hey, Victoria? Yes? I'm sorry. Hey, uh, can I uh, just interrupt? Uh, sorry. Uh, there's too much table noise. If you could uh, see if you can minimize that. There's a lot of table noise? A lot of table like, you noise. Know, like yeah, clicking. just like uh, no, yeah, clicking and banging on the table. Okay, we can we can try. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. All right. Uh, so back to the uh, the coordinate system though. Um, here, if you're having trouble visualizing how this works, I like to think of it as flipping a piece of paper up on a wall so that you can draw on that piece of paper. Absolutely. So your X and your Y are your paper. And you can see that we're not actually changing anything. Our original rectangle is still in the same orientation that we we created it in, but now we're just like Victoria said, just flipping it 90 degrees the other way. I'm going to create a rectangle, and I don't know, maybe maybe something like that. It doesn't have to be exact. And so I started off with a rectangle that is just going to be the, the basis for creating my curved edge in profile. To create a nice profile, what I can do is I can use a spline. I'm going to start in the upper right and you know, do something like that. I don't know, maybe, maybe not nice. If you start with the, you know, your profile and you're not happy with it, you can always just use the control Z to undo your last entry. So maybe, maybe something like that. I don't know, Victoria, what do you think? I think it looks pretty good. Yeah, all, all right. right, let's stick with that. Let's do that. Hit enter to exit out. Now, I don't want to have my edge represented by this box with the spline in between. I, I really got to get rid of this upper part of the box. So I'm going to go to modify, and I'm going to use the break command. And we'll select the outside of the box there. And then that bottom corner, I'm going to hit enter to enter the command again. And now I got rid of that whole section by deleting. And now you'll, you'll see that even though I got rid of that upper edge of the box, things are still two separate objects. And I'm going to actually join them into one. I'm going to go to modify and I'm going to use this guy here, the join, to now join the spline and the box into one object. Now, I'm going to go back to the world coordinate system. You can see here under our view cube, I have this option of toggling between the coordinate systems that I have. I'm going to click on the world coordinate system. Let's go back to home. And I'm going to grab my edge, I'm going to move it into the corner here. Now, what I'm going to do is because I want this, this curved edge represented all the way around this rectangle, I'm going to use the sweep command. I'm going to go over here, select sweep. You see on the command line, select the objects you want to sweep. Now this is the one I want. I'm going to hit enter. And then select the path, which is my rectangle. And then there you go. That profile is now represented just like that. Two pretty simple clicks all the way around my edge here. And if I turn things on, we will see, wow, it's not that bad. I don't know, Victoria, what do you think? Does that look pretty good? Looks great. So there you go. Just a you know quick tutorial, an example of how you can go ahead and uh, create a chessboard. Yeah, sweep is definitely one of those commands that saves you a lot of time on something that seems like it would be really complicated. Yeah, I mean, it was just super fast. And, you know, and I think what will end up taking the most amount of time is the artistic you know, aspect of it, you know, how do you want your thing to, like, actually look like.
Yeah, oh, definitely. The actual implementation of that is is pretty quick. All right, what do you uh, what do you think now? Do we want to? I think maybe we want to design one of those ponds. I like think that's, that's a great idea. Maybe seems like the simplest. Start getting start. into something a little bit more sculptural than than just our board. So yeah, I think so. All right, let's uh, let's move on to our chess pieces. If you guys are following along, you can open up the uh, 3D model chess piece start. And here we go. And if you open it up, you'll see uh, Victoria and I, well, actually, I, I should not say that. Victoria, you definitely spent the most amount of time getting these profiles. I just, I, it's just tracing. It's okay. I, could you, I could not do this. Work. I mean, this is awesome. these yes, look really good. <laughs> but anyway, we, we started off by tracing you know, all of these uh, different profiles for the different chess pieces that we, we want. And um, we're going to go ahead and show you a couple of different methods and techniques for, for creating these. I'm going to start off by showing you guys how to quickly do the pawn. And the pawn's the easy one. Sorry, Victoria, I kind of chose the easy one. It's, it's pretty, I mean, it is the most symmetric. We drew straws. And we did. <laughs> and Victoria got the short one. <laughs> So I'm going to go zoom in here, and you see we got everything labeled for you guys. So again, if you have this file, you know everything's labeled out for you. This was our starting geometry, and I'm going to zoom over to this upper area here. And I want to show you guys two quick ways of creating the pond. Uh, again, pretty simple, definitely the easiest piece that we can do, so it shouldn't take too long to do. The first option I'm going to show you is the revolve. If I go up here, I can select revolve. Select the object you want to revolve. And actually, before I do that, you'll see that there is an option for mode. And I'm not going to touch on this, Victoria, because I think you're going to get into it in much more detail. But you can mention it briefly, yeah, and I'll, I'll walk you through the details. Sure. Later. So if you typed in, in mode, we essentially have our, our option of creating these things in terms of solids and surfaces. But for now, just with the pawn, we'll just stick with the solid. So we'll select solid. I'm going to select my object, enter, and then specify the axis about which I want to revolve. So if I click one point down here and one point up here, and conveniently we got that center axis defined for you guys. And the default is 360 degrees, which is exactly what I want. Anything less than it will appear as though there's a sliver in the pond. So I'm just going to hit enter to get to the 360. And if I hold that shift and center scroll button, you can see, hey, we got our pond. Super quick. Another option we have is using loft. And what we did from our profile, we created a series of circles. You can see them here. And we're going to use the loft command to create either a surface or solid along each one of these circles. Now, the thing is you want to make sure you orient yourself in a way where you can see each one of the circles individually. If there's overlap, um, it might be a little problematic only because the order in which you select things um, does or can matter. Uh, but if you make a mistake, then don't worry about it. We can always use that Control-Z. But let me show you what this is going to look like. I'm going to go down here, select Loft, and I'm going to start. I'm not going to worry about mode or anything like that. I'm just going to start you know, selecting my pieces here. Zoom in. And you'll see how it's starting to shape itself as I select each one of these circles individually. And, you know, oh, you see, again, if you made a mistake, control Z, and you'll go back to your previous point, keep selecting circles. And actually, in testing, we, we found that if we just had like an ending circle, it kind of looked a little weird. We had this stubby top 
to our pond, and eh, we didn't want that. So we actually included, you probably can't see it, but it is there, trust me, there is a point there to kind of finish off our pond, and you'll see that we now have a nice rounded top to it. So you can see we got our two ponds using the revolve and using the loft. They're definitely different looking, but I mean, I guess it, it's like the artistic preference. You know, you guys could play around with this stuff. Definitely encourage you to, to play around and, uh, and see what works best for, for you and, and your workflow. So, Victoria, do you want to step in and uh, start showing them other pieces? Absolutely, yeah. Thank awesome. you for, um, for getting those palms underway. My pleasure. They look great. Okay. So, let's see. Okay, so now that we have these pawns, um, we want to build the rest of the chess set here. Uh, so what I've done is um, I've created some profiles for each one of these, and I'll demonstrate a couple more neat um, tips and tricks and tools uh, to model the, uh, the details on some of these more complicated um, chess pieces. So let's start with the bishop. And for most of these, I'm going to use the revolve command, just because that loft command does take a little bit more time. And I want to be able to get through all of these to, to show you um, all the tools. But you could do the same thing and come in here and draw all these circles and flip them up on their edges and um, uh, get the same sculptural result out of any one of these, um, including the knight, which uh, lends a, a little bit of a complicated challenge, but we'll get to that one last. So for the rest of these, I'm going to switch into my isometric view. And you can see that I have them up here for reference. And I've copied the geometry here in case we want to come back and, and look at this again. So I will start with the bishop and use the revolve command. And I'm actually going to do this one twice. So let me copy this off to the side. So when I revolve the bishop, uh, as Alex alluded to earlier, um, for all of these different commands, revolve, sweep, um, extrude, and loft, you'll have the option to change the mode. Um, so as soon as I click on that revolve command, you'll see at the command line the option MO for mode, or you can just click it. Uh, and then it gives you the option of switching to a solid or a surface. And right now it's defaulted to solid, and I'll leave it there for now. Uh, I, well, let me do the surface first so that I can switch back. All right, so we'll click surface, or if that doesn't work, we'll type in SU, and that will switch the mode to create a surface when we revolve this. So I'll pick this one, and then define my axis. I'm just going to pick two points to do that. If you had an object, you could do that as well. Um, select the object. So here you can see it sort of building as I pull this around. And you'll see that instead of being solid, uh, it is just a shell of the object that's being created. I can see directly inside of it. Uh, so the difference between solids and surfaces is that solids have mass and you can cut into them and, and they're solid all the way through and that surface is not the same, so they don't have mass. They just create the outer skin of that object. And then if you cut into it, typically it leaves a hole, and so if you're trying to 3D print something, it presents a problem because you can't print something that's just, uh, that, that has any perforations in it. Um, it needs to detect that uh, watertight external surface. So just be aware of that as you're modeling. Um, there are ways around that as well. So um, I'm just going to put in 360 degrees, create that surface, and then I will do the same to this one, except I'll make it a solid. All right. Oh, I did it again. Um, there we go. All right, change my mode back to solid. Revolve this. And pick my axis, 360 degrees. Okay, 
So now I have two of these bishops. Oh. I can't get to that uh, other one there. I can't get to that other arrow. Okay, there we go. All right, now I'm looking at them in the top view here, and you can see when I hover over them, uh, this one is a solid, this one is a surface, and you can see the different um, divisions in that surface. Now, if I right-click on it and select Properties, I'm just going to dock my Properties palette over here so that we can see it um, as we work. So, the interesting thing about a revolved surface or solid is that you can actually change the um, angle of revolution on the fly. So, if I accidentally put in 90 degrees or 26 degrees, I can come back here and change it, and, and vice versa. If you just need a little um, thin surface like this, um, and you don't need to revolve it all the way around, you can come back in and modify this later until you get exactly what you're looking for. So I'll put that back to 360 there. So, so don't feel like you're limited to having to revolve that all the way around. Um, it's a very versatile command. So the next thing about the bishop that we want to do is add this um, cutout that, uh, that you get at the top of the, um, the traditional bishop uh, model. So what I've done is trace these profiles and I'm going to extrude them. I can do these both at once. I'll just extrude them up four inches and um, then we can select them. Uh, now from here I want to um, I want to move them down. So if I look at these in um, in the front view, you'll notice that they're um, they're not going all the way through the bishop. They're only going up, uh, about halfway through, and I want to be able to cut those pieces all the way out. So I'm going to move this. Um, I'm going to use my Z axis to just. Um, this down maybe uh, maybe an inch and it's important to verify that when you move a 3d object that it's actually moving um, exactly where you want it to be so checking multiple angles using that view cube is very important um, sometimes it's deceptive and you might think that you moved an object uh, to a particular place but it might just be off to the left or off to the right and uh, it looks right from one angle but you'll notice from another angle that it doesn't look right so checking that for multiple angles is a good idea. So we'll go back into our home view here. Uh, actually, I'm going to do this from the other angle so you can see it get pulled out. Uh, from here, I'll demonstrate the subtract command. And the subtract command can be found on the solid editing panel up here on the ribbon. It's the middle one that looks like uh, it's lit up blue on the left and hollow on the right. So what this lets me do is remove um, one solid from another. So I'll select the object that I want to subtract from. So we'll do the solid first. So I select it, hit enter, and then I select the object that I want to subtract from the other one. And uh, let me do the other one really quickly. I'm going to do the same thing, well, let me show you first what, uh, what it should look like. So this is the solid. Um, if you look inside here, it's actually solid through and through. It's just carved out that little piece like you took a knife and just cut it out of there. Um, if I do the same thing to the surface, and I'll show you what I mean by not having a watertight uh, surface in a second. Um, if I subtract this from the surface version, I get this error message that warns me that I'm subtracting a solid from a surface. Um, there are commands in AutoCAD now that help you um, do this. Uh, surf trim is one of them um, that would help you close up this surface uh, to make it a watertight object. But if I just subtract this solid from it, I'll show you what happens. Oh, did I, I selected the wrong thing? Oh, no, nope, sorry. Uh, undo. All right, subtract. There's my warning. Continue. Select my object. And then if you look really closely here, 
you can see inside of it. And if I look straight down, you can actually see into the object. And you don't want that if you're ever planning to uh, manufacture an object uh, because it's missing a piece. It's just wide open. Um, so if I come back here, I'm going to try this on the fly, and if it doesn't work, we'll move on. But let's see it. Well, no, you know what? We'll save surf trim for another time. Uh, but that demonstrates the difference between solids and surfaces, and one of the things to watch out for uh, with that. So I'll delete that one, and we'll move on to the next object. CA Ward is really hoping that we can do the night next. Is that possible if we do the night? We can jump onto the night. Yeah, all right. Um, I have a whole other file for the night because it jumps into meshes. Do you think we still got time? Maybe we can... Oh, yeah. We, okay. still, we still have time. I'll do the night. The night's really cool. Um, so meshes are interesting. They are an even more sculptural way for you to model. Um, so I've set up a bunch of different profiles. Uh, this is getting into the more complicated side of 3D modeling. And I am by no means uh, the end-all, be-all expert on this, but I'm going to try to show you a, a good introduction to some of the things that you can change to get the type of model you're looking for. Um, so the first thing that I did here was trace out the profile of this, uh, this knight in a spline. So if I select this, the spline is set to um, fit. Um, one of the other things that you can do, and you'll notice that these are just, there are slight variations. There's a little more detail in the ear here and uh, around the head. Um, if you use the other option for spline, um, and that's control vertices. And if I zoom in very close to this one, you can see the control vertices on these that are used to adjust this. And they vary a little bit from the controls on this one. These ones are, these are, uh, the fit is directly on the line, and so it's a, a little bit more, um, it, it, they're just different. Um, I'm sure there's a very technical explanation behind how they're different, but I'm not going to get into that today. Um, over here, the next thing that I've done is I've uh, selected that spline, right-clicked on it, and, con and converted it. Why isn't this letting me? There we go. And under the spline uh, menu, there is an option to convert to polyline. And what I did for these three polylines is I converted them with the p-line convert mode system variable set to zero or one, and then I've adjusted the precision during that conversion to either 1 or 10 um, to show you the difference. So there's a little bit more about that in the help, so if you want to know a little bit more about how those system variables work, um, we'll have some links for that afterwards. Uh, from here though, let's get into the fun part. Um, let's extrude all of these 0.5 inches, and then we'll take a look at them here. I'm going to do these ones as well. Point five. All right. So in order to create a mesh, you'll notice that when I extrude this, they're very rigid. Um, they look kind of cardboardish. Um, they're not very sculptural, like um, this finished one up here. So one way to make these a little bit more sculptural is to use the smooth object command. Uh, you can, it's mesh smooth at the command line or on the mesh tab here, objects, uh, smooth object. And then you can just select these and you'll get this message that asks you whether you really want to convert your 3D solids into meshes because this can have some weird effects on your, on your solids if they're not based on primitives. Uh, so I said yes. And let's just take a look at what some of those have done. Now these are uh, these are the two splines that I started with, 
And then these are the different polylines. And if you adjust the precision on those as you create them, you'll create some very different looking objects. And if you play around with them, um, if, you, if you find that when you convert something to a mesh, it's not looking the way you want it to look, try adjusting some of these variables. Um, try using splines or polylines or adjusting that precision. Um, it's kind of a trial and error art form. And it's amazing to me how different they are just with the different parameters. They, they are. It's They're very, like, Some of them are very, very jagged. So yeah. if you want something that's really abstract, maybe that's the look that you're going for. Yeah, maybe. Um, one other thing here that you can do once it is converted to a mesh is to select them. And you can either use the controls up here in the ribbon for smooth more or smooth less. Um, or you can adjust the smoothness level in the properties palette. So I'll just change this to a level two just to show you what happens. And you'll see them get uh, a little more smooth. I'll bump them up to four so that you can get a, I think I can only go to three with these ones. Sometimes it'll limit you, um, if, you if you go a little bit too far. Um, but it'll just smooth that out. So here's the difference between those two. So you can get that really sculptural look. And then finally, in order to adjust these, so you might not want them to be symmetrical, you can use your sub-object selection, which is to hold down the control key and hover over each of these little faces, their mesh faces, and you can select one or more of them. And uh, let, me, let me just uh, select this one right here. And you can do a series of different manipulations to these um, by grabbing this. You can move them and you'll see it kind of move around. And you can see that if I selected a bunch of them in a particular corner, you could really um, affect the look of that model. Uh, it makes it very flexible. If you right click on this gizmo, it gives you the option to move, rotate, or scale. So if I rotate, it gives me the rotate gizmo and it allows you to rotate that face. And that might come in handy if you need something you know, to, to move in, in such a way. So it makes these very, uh, makes your, what was once a rigid model very versatile. So if I change it to scale, um, you can see that it really just shrinks it in and you get a very different looking uh, mesh face. Uh, so finally on that, once you're happy with the model that you have, If you want to convert it back to a solid, you can do that by selecting it, right-clicking, and going to Convert Mesh to, and then either a faceted solid, a smooth solid, or a faceted or smooth surface, depending on what you're trying to convert to. I'm just going to convert it to a smooth solid, just to show you what I've come up with here. All right. So this is the one that you'll see in that final model there. All right, I know we are running a little short on time here. Um, this actually was a, a good portion to cover. Um, let me jump back in. And we'll revolve these really quickly. And I'll show you. All right, so we get our rook. And we'll accept the default. We'll do the same for the queen. Oh, I picked the wrong, the wrong point. And we'll do the same for the king. And now we very quickly have those last three pieces. And then you'll notice that on the rook here, I've added a little sculptural piece on the top. If you flip this geometry up using your rotate gizmo, you can flip it 90 degrees and then move it into position and then use your press pull. I'll go negative one eighth. 
And we'll do the same for these and say positive one eighth. What really helps with this is to have your dynamic UCS on as well, which I'm hovering over down here in the status bar. Uh, UCS detect is the command or F6. All right, so there we have the rook. And the last thing to do was to extrude or press pull this little sculptural top piece for the king. And then move this down into position. I'm going to eyeball it for the sake of time here, but you can use the union command after that, either up here on the ribbon or at the command line, union, select them, and now it's all one piece. So before we end, let's take a look at the final product here. We've added some materials like we've covered in some previous webinars, and we've moved all of these into position onto the board. And if you're wondering how we moved these, I used the center of face uh, 3D object snap. I said move, and then you can pick that center on the bottom. And then the cool thing is it lights up as you hover over each of these 3D tiles. So you can quickly move them to the center. And there's our chessboard. That's awesome. We made a chessboard in pieces. In under an hour. In under an hour, with the exception right. of actually duplicating the pawns. Indeed. But that was pretty impressive. I, that was That's, uh, good job. I think this is pretty good. Let's um, let's go through a couple of things here. Um, did you want to? No, you want me to wrap it up? Sure. All right. Um, so we have some additional resources for you here if you want to learn a little more about 3D modeling. We'll also send you a collection of videos and um, some links to download the data set after this. If you have any questions for us, uh, feedback, or want to see um, more on a particular topic, just email us at autodesk.help.webinars at autodesk.com. Subject line, build your AutoCAD IQ. We have a bunch of these different series now, so make sure you name us so we know which product you're talking about. Um, you can also ask follow-up questions in our forum thread here. There's a tiny URL if you need it. And the links will be sent out in the reminder email. Before we try to fit in one question, let me run that final poll. We'd like to know, did you learn something new in today's session? We need elevator music or something in the background. Elevator music? I think so. Um, I don't have any on hand. I don't need yeah. mm, All right, we'll leave it open for a few more seconds. So we've got about... Thank you, no Noman, that's great. <laughs> all right, so I will close this out now. Looks like about 94% of you learned something new. That's awesome. fantastic. That's what we like to see. That's um, great. For those of you who didn't learn anything particularly new, I hope it was a good refresher. Um, if there's something more complicated that you want to learn, um, please email us and let us know what you want to see. Yeah, we're, we're very yeah. eager to hear what you guys have to say about the webinar experience, you know, or whether it's good or, or negative. We just want to know so that we can keep bettering the experience for you guys. So definitely don't be shy. Let us know what you think. Yeah. All right, we have about one minute left. Were there any pressing questions uh, so we can address? Check. Great presentation. Great work. Um, there was a couple of people were questioning about um, um, what's the difference between a mesh and a surface. What's the difference between a mesh and a surface? I don't have a really quick way to explain that in under a minute. Um, I have posted a link for some more information on uh, that uh, on AU uh, as well as other uh, websites. Oh, thanks, Noman. That's really great. Um, the, the links help a lot, I, I think, um, for the more complicated topics. It's, uh, it's good to do a little bit of reading afterwards. But if um, we want to present again on meshes, we can do that.
I know there is another webinar that we did completely dedicated to that. It's probably about a year old now, but still relevant. Yeah. All right, we are at the top of the hour. Um, so if we don't have anything um, super pressing, we uh, thank you all for joining us today, and hopefully we'll see you again next week. And yeah. enjoy the rest of your week. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys.